so this is a reminder of the uh, anatomy of the tricuspid valve. As we know that the tricuspid valve is not just the tricuspid leaflets, but also involves the tricuspid annulus, the papillary muscles, and the right ventricle. And the tricuspid valve, of course, involves three leaflets. The biggest leaflet is the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve, and followed by the posterior leaflet and the uh, septal leaflet, which is usually the smallest. And these are attached to papillary muscles, the biggest of which is this anterior papil papillary muscle. And uh, these are the po posterior papillary muscle. And at the septum, it's just held by very small uh, uh, septal papillary muscles. So a pathology in any of these structures can cause uh, tricuspid regurgitation. And of course, uh, for competency of this valve, it involves uh, co-optation of the leaflets, which in turn is influenced by all of these structures. So functional TR is uh, defined as tricuspid regurgitation without organic valvular or myocardial lesions. It is the most common cause of tricuspid valve dysfunction. Not so common in the general population, but very common in patients with heart failure, in particular those with mitral valve disease, where it is present in up to a third of these patients. It's not a benign condition, as we can see from these survivor curves, because if you have moderate or more tricuspid regurgitation, you can see that the survi your survivor is uh, significantly reduced compared to those with no tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, commonly occurs after uh, following left-sided left heart valve disease due to increased left atrial pressures, uh, causing pulmonary hypertension, resulting in dilatation of the right ventricle and dysfunction, um, and also atrial fibrillation, which causes tricuspid annular dilatation and tricuspid leaflet tattering. There, there are a few things about the pathophysiology of functional TR which we need to understand in order to manage these patients uh, optimally and also to uh, plan the uh, surgery. Uh, the first thing to appreciate is that the severity of tricuspid regurgitation is variable. And this is because of the elasticity of the uh, right ventricle. Um, in a given patient, when assessed under different physiologic conditions, depending on their preload, afterload, and uh, contractility, you may have different severity of tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, the second thing to appreciate is that the tricuspid annulus dilates dilates predominantly in the anterior annulus and the posterior annulus, uh, not so much so in the uh, septal annulus. So if we were to measure, uh, if we were to open up the right atrium and measure every tricuspid annulus in a patient undergoing mitral valve surgery, uh, you'll find that it is dilating up to half of these patients as shown in this study. Typically in uh, at surgery, we will measure the annular diameter from this uh, measurement from two fixed points from the anterior septal commissure to the uh, anterior posterior commissure and typically it's about 35 millimeters in, an in, in a normal individual but it can be dilated to, to up to 70 millimeters or more in, uh, 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 in some patients as shown in this uh, diagram. This is of course different from the uh, assessment uh, which we, I think Dr. Sarana will talk more about in the next uh, lecture. Uh, because in a four-chamber view, essentially, this, you, you get this measurement, which is essentially approximately the middle of the septal annulus to the middle of the anterior annulus, and is considered dilated when it's more than uh, 40 millimeters. So we can see from this study that as the tricuspid annulus dilates, uh, beyond 40 millimeters, the volume of tricuspid regurgitation uh, increases significantly, and that, that is where this threshold of 40 millimeters has come about. And similarly, uh, we can see from this study that as the annular area increases uh, uh, above two, the uh, volume of tricuspid regurgitation increases. But even you can see a slight increase in the annular area uh, results in an increase in tricuspid regurgitation. The third thing to appreciate is that the tricuspid annulus is not a flat structure. It is uh, uh, described as a waveform uh, structure, uh, lowest in the uh, uh, septal part of the annulus. But this um, 
um, waveform configuration is lost in patients with uh, functional tricuspid regurgitation. It assumes a, a more flat structure. But typically during surgery, we try to recreate this uh, waveform structure and that's reflected in the design of the rings, which I think we'll hear in, in the third lecture. Fourth thing to appreciate is that just as in functional mitral regurgitation, which is more uh, commonly uh, studied and understood, there is the concept of tricuspid leaflet tethering. And this is defined as the distance between the uh, plane of the tricuspid annulus and the co-optation point or theoretical co-optation point of the tricuspid leaflets. And you can see in this study that as the area or distance within this is increased, so is the uh, uh, volume of tricuspid regurgitation. And this has to do with um, the displacement of the papillary muscles away from, uh, from each other. Because, uh, with dilatation of the tricuspid annulus alone, you have loss of co-optation of the leaflets. And with displacement of the papillary muscles, you also have loss of uh, co-optation of the leaflets. But the two in combination, tricuspid annular dilatation plus a displacement of the papillary muscles results in the greatest uh, loss of uh, uh, co-optation of the leaflets. Uh, the fifth thing to appreciate is that the, um, it, it's not just um, increase in the volumes of the right ventricle, but the uh, geometry of the right ventricle, uh, which, which results in tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, as you can see in this study, which uh, measured what, what they describe as the RV eccentricity index, uh, which is basically a ratio of C, this measurement C divided by D. And you can see as the RV eccentricity index increases B, Beyond two, the volume of regurgitation increases as well. So putting all this together, uh, we can see that uh, tricuspid annular dilatation above four centimeters, a tethering uh, area or lens of above one centimeter, and an eccentricity index of above two is uh, are all predictive of uh, functional TR. So some years ago, um, we proposed this uh, staging of functional tricuspid regurgitation, which takes into account the, uh, not only the amount of regurgitation, but also the dilatation of the uh, tricuspid annulus and also the degree of leaflet tethering. And depending on what stage of functional TR there is, uh, this would um, uh, help decide on, on the surgical intervention and also the type of surgery which is needed. So in conclusion, uh, functional tricuspid regurgitation as an adverse outcome with reduced survival. Understanding the pathophysiology of functional TR is key to the assessment and successful surgical treatment of this condition. Three stages of functional TR can be considered depending on the severity of the TR, annular dilatation, the leaflet co-optation mode, and leaflet tethering. And the technique of tricuspid valve repair can be tailored according to the stage of uh, TR. Thank you very much. I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you to Windsor in England next year because we are organizing a course on functional mitral and tricuspid regurgitation on the 20th and 21st of February. Thank you very much.